death, the old saying goes, is part of life. That wisdom seems especially appropriate if, like today's guest, you're a staff writer on the obituary's desk at the New York Times. She's Marguerite Fox, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me, as always, is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Every week, we use this 30 minutes to try to make sense of the stories that surround us in American public life. Perhaps no story is more ubiquitous, unique, and compelling than the obituary. Marguerite Fox has written more than 1,200 obituaries for the New York Times. She's also an author and musician. Marguerite, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. So uh, I mentioned 1,200 uh, uh, obituaries for the New York Times. Uh, how does one become an obituary writer? Well, the child has not been born that comes home from second grade clutching a theme that says, when I grow up, I want to be an obituary writer. Um, <laughs> one backs into it, or rather lucks into it, because historically obits were Siberia in any newsroom in America. It was where they sent you to punish you. It was where they sent you if you were a hair's breadth away from needing an obit yourself. But <laughs> the dirty little secret is it's the best beat in journalism. Why? Because we're paid to tell stories. Think of how an obit is structured. You say John Smith was born in Providence on January 1st, 1920. John Smith died yesterday. That gives you a built-in narrative arc. And readers love to hear the stories of other people's lives. How does a life go? How much of what happens in a life is the product of free will? How much is dumb luck? How much is pure blind fate? How does Joe Smith get from A to B to C to Z when he crosses my desk in his life? And to be paid to tell stories is the best beat there is. So are there, of those 1,200 obituaries, more than 1,200, are there any that stand out in your memory? The ones obit writers particularly love, and the ones I particularly love, are these unsung heroes, the backstage players, men and women we've never heard of, they're not household names, the men on the street wouldn't recognize them, yet they've done something, invented something, had an idea that somehow changed the world. They're people who, I say, put a wrinkle in the social fabric. I'll give you an example. There was a woman I wrote about maybe 10 years ago, a woman named Ruth Seems, S-I-E-M-S, she spelled it, and she was a home economist for a food company. She lived in Indiana, probably not someone that the New York Times would normally pay attention to. You might normally see her obit in a regional paper or a community paper. Why did we do Ruth Seams' obit? Because she was the home economist that years before had invented a concoction and patented it of dehydrated bread cubes and seasonings that came in a little packet. You put it in a pan, you added water, and you got stovetop stuffing. And God bless her, she did us a solid by dying in November. <laughs> we were able to run her obit the Wednesday of Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving week. week. And I called the company that made stovetop stuffing, because of course, these are news stories like any other. You need to get numbers. And I said, so how many boxes of this stuff are sold at Thanksgiving season? And it's something like 30 million. It's in the tens of millions. Wow. So here's a humble home economist from Indiana whom the man on the street has never heard of who changed American culture, for better or for worse, depending on your opinion. Wow. So how did her passing come to your attention at the New York Times? We all <clears throat> scour, of course, the wires, like Associated Press and Reuters. We scour, these days, of course, websites. We scour the foreign press. 
we scour small town papers. And because there have always been obit groupies out there and the internet is a boon for them, I remember that I came across a little two-line death notice for her that had run in her local paper in Indiana that one of these obit groupies had thoughtfully put on an obit listserv where people discussed both regional obits and obits in national papers like the Times, the Washington Post, LA Times, and for some reason, her achievement had escaped notice of the bigger papers. We got lucky in that case. And so she had died a little bit earlier in November, but by the time we learned of it, Thanksgiving was upon us. Mm. So when you came across that, did you go, wow? Absolutely, and I ran shrieking to my editor and said, <laughs> you are not going to believe who just died. So of course, he, he was thrilled, and we reported the story and got in the paper the day before Thanksgiving. So, so that's a person who lived essentially in obscurity, at least for, for much of her life, mm -hmm. and, and went to a different place after her life with your obituary. You brought us something that I think also may fit sort of that mold. Tell us about this, this cup that you have uh, brought here to us. I did. This is a cup that any New Yorker of a certain vintage will know. It's known as the Anthora. This is the durable ceramic model, but it's really was mass produced in cardboard. It was a cardboard hot coffee cup that New Yorkers drank their takeout coffee, their deli coffee from, their street cart coffee from, all through the 60s, 70s, and 80s before Grande and Vente started taking over yeah. the world. And any art director on any TV show or movie that wanted to invoke Gotham in a second would have his cops or his people in a coffee shop drinking out of these cups. We, it just said New York. And lo and behold, this cup was actually invented by one person, a Holocaust survivor who was born Laszlo Busch, uh, managed to survive Auschwitz, came to America, Americanized his name to Leslie Buck, and had a job as a sales rep for a company that made cardboard cups. And he enterprisingly realized that in those years, most of the diners in New York were owned by Greeks. So he designed a cup with this Grecian theme in the colors of the Greek flag, blue and white, and it has this wonderful motto, we are happy to serve you, and the steaming golden coffee cups. And his customers, who were these Greek coffee shop owners, bought them literally by the millions. And so they were ubiquitous on the New York landscape for decades. And we found out he died. Again, the classic case of someone you've never heard of who put this marvelous object into circulation because he had a bright idea one day in the 1950s and ran with it. And we opened the Ovid up to reader comments and we got the most wonderful comments from New Yorkers present and past, there was one person who said, I had to move to Hong Kong for my job, but when I saw, I'm a New Yorker, when I saw this Obed, I started to cry. New Yorkers really feel <laughs> intense about this cup. My favorite reader comment was a simple one, someone who just said, who loves your baby? <laughs> <laughs> because you'd see this cop every week on coach. And, and I'm guessing almost everyone who, of the millions of people who had or saw one of those cups, most probably until your obituary, had never known who was behind this. Exactly. So it really is a way of writing, in this case, American material culture. Where does our culture come from? And one of the great privileges and the great pleasures of writing obits is if you're very lucky and all your facts check out, you can actually pinpoint where part of material culture comes from directly to one individual. And that, that's thrilling. You know, so yeah, absolutely. One of the things that strikes me just in our couple of minutes talking here is that there's a certain amount of <coughs> There's a, there's a whimsicalness about about some of the some of the folks that you've written about. Is there is there a, a criteria uh, when you're deciding that okay this is this person is going to get a New York Times obituary? Uh, is there a criteria that they have to meet? 
Well, the editors decide, and then they make assignments to the writers, people uh, like me and my colleagues who were in the troops actually reporting and writing the story. Uh, we have input, of course. So there's no single criterion that will do it for everyone because people are complex creatures and everyone is different. There are certain people who are shoo-ins. What I say is if you're the president or the king or queen of something, mm. it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get a news obit in the New, New York Times. If you're an old-time Hollywood film star, or a Spencer Tracy or a Katherine Hepburn, guaranteed. If you're a Supreme Court justice or a senator, again, guaranteed. But it's these people in the middle who have to be decided case by case who were the most interesting. And for them, like Leslie Buck, our cup maker, like Ruth Seams, our home economist, the general criterion is, did he or she change the culture mm. in some way, large or small? It can be writing a book, making a film, inventing a cup. So let's go from Leslie Buck, who was a relatively, quote unquote, unknown to somebody who is incredibly well known and that would be Charles Manson. Oh yes. One of your most recent obituaries. Talk about that obituary. Well that obituary was an advance obit and a very much a case in point. We although probably 90 percent of the work of the Times obituary section are breaking news obits that are written on daily deadline and put into the next day's paper and put onto nytimes.com even sooner, uh, like any other news story in the paper. But there is a whole other class of obits that we call advances, and they are written for people whose careers are so long, so complex, so deeply covered that the journalist doesn't want to get caught short having to write those on a deadline of a couple of hours, although of course it happens. We've all had that experience. So again, the Hollywood film star, obviously a president sitting or past, the Supreme Court justice, all of those would be cases in point, candidates ripe for advance obits. And when we have lulls in the crush of daily obits, part of our job also is to get these longer, more complex advance obits in the can. And often they sit for years. We call it the kiss of life. You'll very often <laughs> hear as an obit writer, so-and-so is hanging by a thread. Your editor will call come over with a rather frantic look in his eye and say, drop everything, get 200 words in the can because we hear so-and-so is going to die. You drop everything, you get 200 words in the can, and so-and-so lives another 10 years. <laughs> uh, Charles Manson, case in point, we had heard quite a number of years ago that he was ill. He was already not a young man. The obit that ran in the paper the other week, I wrote in 2009. Wow. Now, there was a lot of reaction to that obituary, and I'm, I'm going to guess, not being privy to your internal numbers, that it was one of the most read stories and certainly obits of, of recent memory. What were some of the reactions? How did the, the range of reader reactions go to that obituary? Well, I knew when I s signed on to do that advance obit, which I did not because I am any sort of Manson groupie, heaven for fin, but because I'm interested in true crime. And again, just as the great heroes of history give you interesting narratives, so too do the great villains. You may feel at the end of the day you've spent inhaling their life that you want to go home and take a shower and wash them off but ideally you have a fully reported rigorous balanced narrative proper news obit in the can for them and we've done besides the Mansons of this world we've done Nazi war criminals we've done the great enforcers of segregation in the Jim Crow South and again doesn't mean we're fans we're not in the veneration business but they have to be done. These Dear people reporter. these people made the news and they helped shape the world for good or ill, so their obits too have to be done. With Manson, uh, I knew this would happen and it did, but only to a small extent. There are still many people who think that obits are eulogies and in smaller town papers where for budgetary reasons they don't have an obit staff, they will take the press release from the family or from the funeral home and stick it in the paper. They have no choice. And so, lo and behold, everyone who dies in that town was a saint, was died surrounded by 
everyone he ever loved and touch the lives of everyone he ever knew. Mm -hmm. We, of course, don't do that. Our news obits, be they of Charles Manson, of political figures, are warts and all portraits. But we do have this popular conception out there that we work hard to try to dispel that obits are eulogies. So I had a few furious emails the day the Manson ran saying, how dare you venerate this man with a Times obit. I had one rather comical one that said, nice obit, but how dare you give this guy the respect by calling him Mr. Manson on subsequent reference. Well, because that's what we do. It's time style. Uh, so you can't win. But uh, actually, the reader response was pretty positive, and most said what I'd hoped, which was, it was the obit was a chilling read, but thank you for recapitulating historical memory of that time. And that's my job. We need to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. An audio version of this program can be heard three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS Channel 124. The show is produced each week by a ridiculously talented team at Rhode Island PBS. We're so grateful to all of them for the work that they do. I'm Jim Lutis, the Executive Director of the Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy at Salve Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutis. My co-host to my right is G. Wayne Miller, an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and the author of 17 books. You can find him on Twitter, too, at G. Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week is a senior writer with the New York Times and author of two books. Margalit Fox is on Twitter at Margalit Fox, M-A-R-G-A-L-I-T-F-O-X. It's two books, right? That's right. Two okay. books and a third and, one coming out third next one year. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, I, I, what I'm fascinated about, though, is the uh, the vastness of the of the the range of topics that you have to cover on a daily basis. So I, just looking through your Twitter feed, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, uh, artists and poets and uh, engineers and, you know, people like Charles Manson and people who invent cups. How do you master that kind of, like, what, what core basic knowledge do you fall back on uh, to be able to cover that expanse of human existence. The basic knowledge of how to read the clips quickly and work the internet quickly. <laughs> and, and have a nose for what's good information online and what's bad, because there's a lot of both <clears throat> online now, and one has to be very careful. But we are paid to be generalists. Instant expert, one of my colleagues memorably called it. And I think she called it that on the day that she was running around the office shrieking, does anyone know anything about exotic chickens? <laughs> because she was doing a breeder of exotic chickens. I have done literally the president of Estonia, a woman who ran a school for belly dancers, an underwater cartographer, and the inventor of the crash test dummy. So it never gets old. It never gets dull. Um, it does keep you on your toes, and you do it through a combination of training, adrenaline, caffeine, and a kind of sixth sense about what is good information, what is bad. Let, let me just pick up on that piece for a second, because one of the challenges I think that we face as a society right now is that we're not information literate, right? We, we as a society, we struggle to discern what's good information and what's bad information. You're a journalist, you've been trained in this. What is there, do you have an insight about the sort of that basic ability to adjudicate between good information and bad information that's missing from the rest of the public? Well, that's a tall order, and I don't know if I have a prescription for the public, but when I teach uh, young journalists, I will say never use uh, a certain online popular encyclopedia site except to get your bearings. Never take anything from a site where there may be too much democracy, a, a sentence I would normally never say, mm -hmm. but to which anyone can contribute, so there's no quality control. The only reason to use those sites is to get your bearings and to know what facts to confirm or disconfirm elsewhere. So to paraphrase you, no child is born with an ingrained desire, wish to grow up and be an obituary writer, even though you've made it sound like an incredibly fascinating <laughs> job now. It's like I miss my calling. 
So what path did you follow to get to where you are today? Well, my original training was as a cellist. I then have a couple of degrees in linguistics. I grew up in an academic family. My father was a college professor. And so I assumed rather naively that I would follow that path uh, because the college communities can be rather parochial. And everyone I knew was a professor. Uh, all of my friends were the children of professors. And when I started work on a PhD in linguistics, I realized pretty quickly that I didn't want to struggle through you know, five or six years of coursework, a couple of years of a dissertation, only to have to get an academic job in some backwater at a third grade <laughs> college. I wanted to live in New York. That's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That, 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 and, that is a, a truthful uh, statement. Right. This was in the early 80s, and already there was such retrenchment in universities that there weren't any jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I came back to New York, and I thought, my goodness, the only marketable skills I have are I could read and I could write. Um, so I had rather uh, offensive, low-level, entry-level jobs in book and magazine publishing. And around that time, I met the man I married, and he was this magical thing. He was a freelance writer, and I had never known anyone who did that. And I realized that's a license to be a dilettante in the best way. <laughs> you don't have to decide what you want to do, but you get to look in on what everybody else does and ask people probing questions about that and write, we hope, interesting stuff about that. So that got me started down that path. And when I was a little older, I went back to Columbia Journalism School, got a master's, and have been in newspapers ever since. Do you, do you, have you ever met uh, one of the subjects of your uh, obituaries while they were still alive? Well, occasionally someone will cross my desk who is not alive, whom I realize I have met and interviewed in other contexts as a journalist. It's rare. We do, when we write advance obituaries, try to talk to and interview the subjects of our Do they know why you're calling? Well, it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not taking the call from Ms. Fox. Thank you. Goodbye. Right. If I call your house, hang up yeah, don't call my house, and please. run. I'm not giving my phone number. If, um, if we do, and if the person is physically and cognitively up to talking to us, there's a wonderful euphemism that I use that comes from the Times' great obituary writer of mid-century, Alden Whitman. And Whitman was famous for sitting down with his advanced subjects while they were still alive. And he would say, everything you tell us will be embargoed during your lifetime. That's standard. <laughs> and so often, they would tell wow. very, very Force revealing yeah, things sure. because they knew it was no skin off their nose. They weren't going to be around to read it. Um, he had a wonderful euphemism that he would use when he called up to make the interview appointment because there's no Emily Post for this. The etiquette book has not been written that gives instructions as to how to cold call someone and say, you know, this is so-and-so from the Times. We know you're getting on in years, and uh, <laughs> we'd like to write your obituary. There's no delicate way to put that. So what Alden Whitman said was, this is Whitman from the Times. We're updating your biographical file. And I use that all the time because people can take on board as much as they can handle. And people aren't stupid. I once said that with a quite elderly woman who invented one of these artifacts of popular culture that I would love to tell you about, but can't because it's forthcoming. She was well into her 90s. She's something like 96 or 97 now. And when I called her last year and said, this is Fox of the Times, we're updating your biographical file, she chirped gaily, oh, you're writing my obituary. <laughs> <laughs> so you never That's know. <laughs> what a marvelous story. You are also an accomplished author. And your most recent book was The Riddle of the Labyrinth, The Quest to Crack an Ancient Coat. Briefly, what was that about? And then we want to hear about your forthcoming book. The Riddle of the Labyrinth is the true story of the 50-year quest to decipher a mysterious Bronze Age script. No one knew what the script was. It was weird little pictographic characters. No one knew what language it was. It was dug up for the first time on clay tablets on Crete in 1900 and not deciphered until 1952 because it's, as I say, it's the linguistic equivalent of a locked room mystery, an unknown script 
writing an unknown language, how do you ever find your way into a closed system puzzle like that? Excellent. And you have a book coming out in June, and you were telling us about that. We definitely want to hear about that. Thank you. The book's coming out June 26th from Random House. It's called Conan Doyle for the Defense, and it is a historical true crime story about a murder in Edwardian Glasgow for which an innocent man, a Jewish immigrant, was framed by police and prosecutors because they wanted to run him out, out of town anyway. Under pressure to close a case, let's kill two birds with one stone. He missed the gallows by this much, was sentenced to life at hard labor, and after almost 20 years breaking up rocks in a Scottish quarry, he smuggles out a message to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle, using Sherlock Holmes's methods, personally reinvestigates the case and wins this man's freedom. That's wow. Really, that's going to be a great summer read. Uh, Absolutely. We'll look forward to that for sure. Uh, we've only got about a minute left here, but I'm, I'm curious, if you thought about uh, whom, who you would want to write your obituary and what you might want them to say? Well, it's a question I'm often asked, and we do uh, joke in the department at the end of long weeks that we should all just go out and each have about three or four drinks and write one another's advance <laughs> over it. Uh, we've, we've never actually done it. Uh, obviously, I, if, if I even get one, uh, it would need to be a smart journalist, presumably someone younger than I, and I hope that he or she would say uh, that I was a decent stylist and was able to animate American social history through these lives and didn't mess up too many times. And a great storyteller, as you have Absolutely. just demonstrated here. Uh, Marguerite Fox, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. The, she's with the New York Times, and uh, we want to thank uh, everyone for listening on POTUS, watching at home, or streaming somewhere on your device. We'd be nowhere without you, so we thank you for giving us your time and joining us each week. If you want to know more about Story in the Public Square or catch up on past episodes, you can always visit PellCenter.org, or you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis. We hope you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Square.